Well, I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Uh, You're going to need a Bible open and in your lap this morning to be able to follow along with the Scripture. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one of the Black Pew Bibles in front of you, turn to page 61, and you'll be able to follow along there. In Exodus chapter 20, very well-known passage, it's where we find the first record of the Ten Commandments as they're given from God to Moses to his people. This week we'll look at the first five, and the next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the last five. A few years ago, CNN ran an article with this headline, Behold, Atheists' New Ten Commandments. The article began like this, What if, instead of climbing Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God, Moses had turned to the Israelites and asked, Hey, what do you guys think we should do? Well, it turns out two atheist authors did just that, and this is really so that they could promote their book. They had a book that was coming out, and so they did a poll, an internet poll, where they polled people or asked people to submit what they think would be uh, good ideas for the new Ten Commandments. And so the thesis of their book was, you can be good without God. And so they're trying to get those kinds of submissions. They had a total of 2,800 submissions of potential commandments from 18 different countries. Here is what their team of 13 judges selected as the top 10 non-commandments. Number one, they said, be open-minded and be willing to alter your beliefs to new evidence. Number two, strive to understand what is most likely to be true, not to believe what you wish to be true. Number three, the scientific method is the most reliable way of understanding the natural world. Number four, every person has the right to control their body. Number five, God is not necessary to be a good person or to live a fully meaningful life. Number six, be mindful of the consequences of all your actions and recognize that you must take responsibility for them. Number seven, treat others as you, as you would want to be treated and can reasonably expect them to want to be treated. Think about their perspective. Number eight, we have the responsibility to consider others, including future generations. Number nine, there is no one right way to live. Number 10, leave the world a better place than you found it. These sound like 10 commandments you would get from an internet poll, right? This is what you would expect people to say. Some of these are just kind of common sense, be open-minded, try to leave the world a better place than you found it. But I think what they don't know is they unknowingly, unwittingly, actually quoted Jesus in one of the commandments when they quoted the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. Something else they may not have known is that the scientific method, as we understand it, was actually developed by Christian scientists seeking to understand the universe they believed God created. And notice particularly the ninth commandment, which is really the most laughable of all. There's no one right way to live, but then they give nine other ways you ought to live. Well, which is it? Is there's no one right way or you got to follow the other nine ways? Both can't be true. I know it's only an internet contest, but the authors of the book seem to think that crowdsourcing ethical wisdom on the internet is good. In fact, notice what one of the authors is quoted as saying in the article, humans are hardwired for compassion. The tribes that gather online each day will weed out bad ideas. Yeah, that's what we can expect on the internet. People weeding out bad ideas. Tribes gathering online are great for developing morality and ethics and public policy on our internet polls. The British government tried this very thing. A few years ago, they put out a contest online where people could submit their idea for naming a new British vessel. It was a $286 million research vessel that was going to go into the polar area. The British government um, agency submitted some ideas that you may want to consider For instance, the HMS Shackleton or Endeavor or Falcon. But the runaway winner, and it wasn't even close, was what the New York Times presented, Bodie McBoatface. (laughs) What you get when you let the internet decide. Well, the British agency overrode that internet poll, and they named this vessel after Sir David Attenborough, whose voice narrates the planet Earth series. I'm just spitballing here, but maybe, maybe internet polls are not the way we ought to develop our ethics. Maybe doing public polls is not how we can determine the guardrails for a flourishing society. 
Maybe, just maybe, we should look to our Creator. And that's exactly what we're going to seek to do this morning. We're going to look at the first of the Ten Commandments, the first five this morning. I'm going to read all 21 verses of this section in chapter 20. So we have the context of the first five that we're going to be zeroing in on today. This is the inspired and errant word. Follow along as I begin reading in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood afar off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. These are the Ten Commandments. Now, what's important to understand is these are not the only commandments in the Bible, These are not the only commandments that God will give through Moses to the people. These are not the only commandments in the book of Exodus. In fact, scholars have counted the number of commands that God gave through Moses to the people, and it wasn't 10, it wasn't even 100. They've they've counted 613 commandments that God gave to the people of Israel. Those 613 are really an expansion of, if you will, these 10. They give specific application of the Ten Commandments. What's interesting is that Jesus was asked on one occasion, recorded in Matthew 22, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And when he responded, he responded not with one, but with two. Notice what he said in Matthew 22, beginning of verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so what Jesus did was he summarized the 613, he summarized the 10 down to two. And he says, these are the two commandments that you've got to follow. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And people throughout the ages have often summarized those two commandments with four words. Love God and what? Love people. So the title for my sermon today is simply this, Love God. We're going to look at the first five of the Ten Commandments, which are under this column or this heading, Love God. Next week, we'll look at the next five, the last five that are under the heading, Love People. And many people often refer to these two headings as being the two tables of the law. Here's why. Not here in chapter 20, but as we get into chapter 32 and then again in chapter 34, we will see that God inscribes with his finger these 10 commandments on tables or tablets of stone. And so many, when referring to them, refer to the two tables or the two tablets, one tablet being 
love God, the other tablet being love people. It should be noted that here in chapter 20, these 10 commandments are only given orally. They're only given verbally. It's not till chapter 32 when God inscribes them on the stone. And since Jesus summarized the 10 down to two, I think it's altogether appropriate that we summarize the 10 commandments into two sermons. But you need to know, I'm putting the division of the Ten Commandments at a different place than where many put it in the love God, love people categories. Many put the first four in the love God category and the last six in the love people category. I'm gonna make it even uh, five and five and I'll explain why I put honor your mother and your father in the first category of loving God when we get to it. Now before we break down the first five, I do wanna remind you of the specific intention and the specific context of the Ten Commandments. If you weren't here last week, you need to know the context. This is the marker, this is the legislation of what's known as the Sinai Covenant. Last week we saw that the people of God and God himself entered into what's known in law as a bilateral agreement. That both sides have elements of this contract, if you will, of this covenant that they must each uphold. If one of them breaks their side of the covenant, then the covenant is null and void. And we saw last week, we considered last week that the people of Israel said, yes, we will do all that you tell us to do. So we get to chapter 32, they're at the base of the mountain with a full on orgy worshiping a golden calf. Did they break the covenant? Yes, they broke the Sinai covenant. They broke the agreement. And now before we break them down, I also want us to know that before we start studying them, I think it's important to reiterate the first two verses because this sets them up, this introduces them. Look at verse one and two again. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What's he doing? He's telling them who he is and what he's done. This is who I am and this is what I have done. This is a reiteration, if you will, of the gospel. How were they rescued from the house of slavery? What was the final plague by which they were brought out? It was through the blood of the lamb. That's how he rescued them. And guess what, Christian? That's how he's rescued you, through the blood of the lamb. And so before he gives one single law, he says, you need to know, one, who I am, and two, what I have done. In fact, look at this next slide. Understanding who God is and what he has done for you both informs and inspires obedience to his commands. But we need to think on that and meditate on who God is and what he has done. I wanna make one more comment before I break down the first five commandments, and that is, again, last week I went through great pains to describe to you that this covenant was their covenant. Mount Sinai was their mountain. This law was their law. That is not our mountain. Our mountain is Mount Calvary. That is not our covenant. Our covenant is the new covenant of grace, not the old covenant of law. Now, having said that, you may think, well, then why in the world would we, would we even study these? Why would we look at these? If that's their contract, and that contract is in fact null and void because of the thousand times they've broken the contract, why may, would we study not just the 10 commandments, but the 613 commandments that may follow. Why would we study the rest of the book of Exodus? I'm glad you asked that question, class, because here's why. For one, these commands are not arbitrary. These commands express the heart, the character, the nature of God. As we study these commandments, even though they are the legislation for the old covenant, they still express who God is, and it's good for us to know who God is. Understanding who God is will help us obey his commands. But secondly, we study these because of these 10 commandments, nine of them are reiterated and reasserted to Christians in the New Testament. Only one of these 10 commandments are not repeated and not reasserted in the 10 commandments. And we'll see which one it is today later on in the message. Secondly, we study it because of that reason. I mentioned last week that we are not antinomians. Anti means against namas meaning law. We are not against the commands of God. We are not against the law. We're not anarchists who live by no rules. No, just the opposite. As Christians, one of the identifying markers of us is that we obey the commands of Christ. This is exactly what Jesus said in John 14. He says, whoever 
has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is an identifying marker of a Christian, that you obey his commandments. And again, nine of the ten are reiterated in the New Testament. It's one of the commandments we'll consider today. In fact, look at this next slide. I want us to understand this principle. For the Christian, salvation is not the reward for obeying God's commands. Salvation is the reason for obeying God's commands. You understand what I mean by that? Salvation is not works-based. You don't gain salvation as a reward because you've checked off a box of commands. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is not the reward you get. Oh, you've done enough of the commands. You've obeyed enough. You get salvation. It's the opposite. Salvation by grace through faith alone is the reason for obeying Christ's commands. It's the motivation for obeying Christ's commands. So let's consider the first five today on the love God table of the Ten Commandments. First of all, the Ten Commandments and the commands repeated in the New Testament call us to exclusive allegiance. Exclusive allegiance. And this is exactly what the first command does. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. I want you to circle those two words, no other. That's exclusive. No other gods whatsoever. Now, it's important to note the wording of this commandment, the first one. If you have an ESV Bible open, you may look at the word before there in verse 3, and you see it has a footnote. If you look down at the bottom of the page, it will say, or it could be translated besides. You shall have no other God besides me. So either before or besides. What's the difference between before and besides? Well, if we just think of, well, no other gods before the Lord God, well, that may mean we could have other gods just so long as we don't have them in first place. Now, we can have a multitude of gods just so long as they're not number one. It's like the, the boyfriend that says to his girlfriend, honey, you my main squeeze. Does that mean he has other squeezes? That's the question she should ask. Who are these other squeezes that you're hanging on to? Not just the main squeeze, the only squeeze. God is saying, I don't want any other gods, none other besides me. One of our missionaries that we support uh, serves with predominantly Hindu people uh, in his work. And I was talking with him about a year and a half ago about his work, and he was describing to me how he has seen Hindu people come to faith in Jesus. Now, you need to understand Hinduism is a polytheistic religion. Poly meaning many, theos meaning gods. So they had many gods, not just four or five gods, not just a few dozen gods, not even thousands of gods. It's estimated that Hinduism has, get this, as many as 33 million different gods. And he says when someone comes to faith in Jesus, often here's the path they take. Step one, is this, I like Jesus, he's now one of my gods. Step two, Jesus is my favorite God. And then step three, Jesus is my only God. And you gotta recognize that is huge for someone who was brought up in this polytheistic religion to make a declaration, Jesus is my only God. And this is exactly what his exclusive allegiance is calling for. See, the children of Israel had a problem with this. All throughout their history, they had a problem with bringing other gods alongside the one true God. We see an example of this in 2 Kings chapter 17. The Bible says this, and you shall not forget the covenant. That's Exodus chapter 19 we looked at last week. That I have made with you. You shall not fear other gods. Now look at verse 41. So these nations feared the Lord, that's Yahweh, and also served their carved images. What are they saying? Yes, God, we think we're thankful for you. We fear you. We love you. But we want to have these other gods over here that we're worshiping. I also want you to consider the placement of this commandment. It is the first of the ten. And it could be argued that if you followed and obeyed this commandment, you wouldn't have a problem with the other nine. If God is truly your exclusive, uh, uh, that you love, that you worship, that you serve, that you're allegiant to, then you're not going to have a problem with murder. <laughs> you're not going to have a problem with shoplifting. 
You're not going to have a problem with crafting idols that you're going to bow down to. You're not going to have a problem with coveting your neighbor's stuff. So that's the first commandment that he calls us to. Number one, exclusive allegiance. That leads to the second commandment we'll consider in this first table of the law, and I'm calling it excluded affection. The second commandment calls us to an excluded affection, and this one has to do with idols, carved idols, having some type of carved image that you utilize to stir your religious affection, your religious uh, inspiration. Let's say you have this carved image and you put it on a shelf. That's a bad thing if it's something that you worship. You might say you have a bad shelf image. (laughs) That pun was worth the price of admission right there. Don't have a bad shelf image, okay? Now, the reason I'm calling it, I worked a long time on that, folks. The reason I'm calling this excluded affection uh, is that the, we should not have affection, love for any other God. And it's right here in the middle of this command. God describes it as this no-go territory for one reason. Look at it. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, we may see that and we say, jealousy? We sometimes think of jealousy as being a bad emotion, a bad thing. What in the world could I possibly have that the omnipotent ruling God of the universe would be jealous of? I'll tell you, your affection. Think of this. When a husband and wife are married, they make a covenant together. They vow to one another, you will be my one and only. And if a husband happens to see, whether in person or through internet conversations, his wife flirting with another man, does he have a moral right to be jealous? Absolutely he does. It's not a sin. She has vowed to give him and him alone her affection. And God is saying, guess what? To an infinitely greater degree, I desire your love. I am a jealous God. And this is not some kind of controlling manipulation that he has. It's simply that he loves you and he has expressed his love to you and he desires for you to have this kind of faith monogamy. Now this morning, morning we could spend a lot of time on this second command talking about the invisible idols that exist in our world and that are so attractive to us. And usually most preachers in the 21st century, that's the application they make. What I mean by invisible idols, thing like, things like prosperity or power or prestige or fame or reputation, prominence. You know, those are all true. Those are types of idols that we can pursue. But I want to keep our consideration of idolatry to exactly what the context of the commandment is. Carved images, graven things that could be worshipped or are worshipped. What this commandment is not talking about, let me give you a little caveat here. The commandment is not talking about art. Some Protestant reformers through church history have taken this second commandment and said, well, then any kind of image, any kind of drawing, any kind of painting, any type of sculpture that depicts something in creation, something in heaven, something on earth, some type of person, all that art is bad. Well, that's all art. (laughs) All art reproduces some imagery. We know that's not what God means because in just five chapters in chapter 25, God will instruct Moses to build the mercy seat that goes on the Ark of the Covenant, and he instructs them very clearly to make some hammered gold cherubim, some angelic artwork, put that on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So it's not art, okay? So what is this? Carved images. Well, the text itself confines the commandment to worshiping Carved images, worshiping statues, worshiping things of human construction. And you may think, well, come on, pastor. This is 2024 in the, in the United States of America. We are a highly intellectual, technologically advanced society. We don't have this kind of idolatry around us. Actually, we do. I came across this anecdotal evidence the other day. Look at this next slide. It says this, a Brazilian woman prayed to a figurine of St. Anthony for years. Now watch this. Only to discover it was actually an action figure of the elf Elrond from the Lord of the Rings films. 
Now, we can laugh at that, silly Brazilian woman worshiping an action figure, but this is what's happening in our world today. People have images. People have carved things, these statues or emblems, icons, and they worship them. Now, we may think this is only limited to those who are of, like, maybe the Roman Catholic flavor of faith, but it's not. And I would say that any image, any graven thing, any, anything that you cling to because you feel like it increases your religious affections, that would be breaking this commandment. So, for instance, maybe you have a, a picture of Jesus that was very well loved by your grandmother. And you would say, well, you know, whenever I pray, I just look at that picture of Jesus because I feel closer to Jesus. That would be breaking this commandment. That is an image representing or supposedly representing God. Maybe you have a cross. I just feel closer to God when I'm holding on to this cross while I'm praying. I would say to you, as your pastor lovingly, that is an example of using an item, an article, even if it's supposed to represent God, it's a breaking of this commandment. 26 years ago, I was the youth pastor at First Baptist Church, Fort Meade, Florida, and we were preparing to go on a mission trip to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. We were going to go to that army base, and we are going to run a, a VBS all week long. We had hired a commercial bus to take us there. So as often I would do on mission trips before we took off in this charter bus, we gathered around in a big circle, and I prayed for us, the whole team, prayed for God's protection, prayed God would be with the driver, and then said amen. After that prayer, the, truck driver, or the bus driver came over to me and says, I need you to know something. We're going to be completely safe on this trip from Florida to North Carolina. I said, well, that's good. I thought he was going to quote to me his driving record. Here's what he did. He pointed to this little angel pin on his lapel. I never go anywhere where without my angel. And I said, idolater. No, I didn't say that. I said, okay, kids load up on the bus. We're going. That's idolatry. You think this little pin is going to bring you some good luck, good fortune? I'm wearing my lucky socks. I'm going to win the game. That's what it is. It's idolatry, simply by clinging to it. And uh, notice how Paul reiterated this, the uh, second commandment in the New Testament. He said this in Acts 17. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Those things made of stone, or silver, or any kind of image, that does not represent God. It is not God, and they are not to be used for worship. Now, you may say, hold on a second, Troy. We got a bunch of crosses in this sanctuary. Why do we have those emblems, those icons? We got a big one right there that has lights behind it. Those are reminders. We don't look to them and say, worship. In fact, I would say I've seen Christian groups do this before. They have a big cross down front, and they call people to come bow down at the cross. I would say, my informed opinion, that's idolatry. You don't bow down to a graven image, even if it's a cross. It reminds you. Next week, we're going to have a reminder meal. We're going to have two elements, the bread and the juice. We don't worship those. They are simply there to remind us of what Christ has done. Make sense? Okay, number three. Let's move to the third one, and that's what I'm calling expected articulation. Expected articulation. When it comes to talking, when it comes to our speech, when it comes to articulated language, there is an expected way that the follower of God is to talk, how he should talk, how he should not talk. And this is especially true when it comes to the way we talk about God. It's especially true with the way we use his name. Notice again what the third commandment says, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I have a couple things I want to point out here. First of all, it is God who is speaking to Moses. And it's interesting, I find, that God speaks of himself in the third person. He does not say, no one should take my name in vain. But he speaks 
in the third person. No one should take the name of the Lord in vain. And it's all caps there, the personal name of God. Yahweh is the Hebrew word underneath there. He accentuates the status of his name. And I would say in our world today, that God's status, the status of his name is brought very low by our language, by the way we use his name. And part of the reason we have difficulty with understanding and even interpreting this commandment is because of the word name. Names today just don't mean a whole lot. Names today don't really represent your character or maybe what you look like or aspects of who you are. Rarely do our names match who we are. I had a friend in high school. His name was Chip. Chip. True story. This is not a preacher joke. This is true. And he had an older sister who went you know, the same grade as my brother Tony. Her name was Crystal. Their last name, Glass. Chip Glass and Crystal Glass. I think the dad came up with those names. Crystal Glass. Now, that was their real names on their birth certificate. But did it represent anything about their physical makeup? No, they were not transparent. They were not see-through, even though their names were Chip and Crystal Glass. Another church, that church in Fort Meade I serve, we had two girls in that church. One's name was Wendy. The other name was Misty. Their last name, Gale. Wendy Gale and Misty Gale. What a cruel father. Um, God's name is different. Listen, God's name is who he is. When we see the name of God, any name of God, as it's described in the Bible, it's not just a moniker. It's not like us, me, a name I call myself. It is who he is. It represents his character and his nature. So God's name is completely different. Most of us, of course, of course would shudder at using God's name as a curse word. That is, of course, blasphemy. We would never say God next to the curse word that rhymes with bam, right? That should be highly offensive to us as Christians, whether it's in person or on a television, right? We don't use God's name as a curse word. We, don't, we aren't entertained by using God's name as a curse word. But it's not just that. It's also, listen, if you present yourself as a Christian in church, in the workplace, in your community, among your family, if you say, I am a Christian, whose name do you have? The name of Christ. If you say, I'm a Christian, you have the name of Christ attached to you. And so the way you live your life, listen, the way you act in the stands at your kid's ball game can either blaspheme and profane the name of Christ or it can honor the name of Christ. The way you deal with your neighbor who may be encroaching on your private property, the way you do that can either blaspheme the name of Christ or honor the name of Christ. The way you work in your workplace, if you put in a full day's work for a full day's pay, will either blaspheme or honor the name of Christ. Employers, the way you treat your employees, your workers, will either blaspheme or will honor the name of Christ. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In fact, it is this very context that Paul reiterates this, second com this third command in the New Testament, he's writing to his son of the faith, Timothy, and as he's writing to Timothy, who is pastoring this little congregation, he's giving him instruction, and through him, instruction to the whole church, and he gives a particular word to those who are in the church that are in the unfortunate, unfortunate social structure of being what we might call indentured servants or slaves. They've come to faith in Christ, but their status as slaves has not changed. Notice what Paul says to them. In verse 1 of chapter 6, he says, Let all who are under a yoke, that's slavery, as bondservants, regard their own masters, those people who own them, as worthy of all honor. Why? Why should this be important? Here's the repetition of the third commandment in the New Testament. So that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled or thought of in vain. The way you work, the way you live, the way you cheer on your kid's team will either bring honor or blasphemy to the name of God. This is an important command of how we live our lives as Christians. Do not blaspheme the name of the Lord your God. That leads to the fourth commandment we'll consider, exertion 
abated. If you think I'm pushing it here, you just try to do double alliteration sometimes. It's not always easy. Abatement means to uh, end, put an end to something. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now, this commandment, the fourth commandment, is the only commandment of all ten commandments that is not reiterated in the New Testament. The commandment regarding the Sabbath day, remembering the Sabbath day, honoring the Sabbath day, there is no reenunciation of this commandment in the New Testament. Now, a few weeks ago, when we were in the passage in, in Exodus where we considered God providing manna from heaven, we considered this concept of Sabbath then. You remember what happened? God says, you're going to find manna in the morning with the dew. You collect that manna, but only collect the day's worth. Don't try to hoard it because every day there's going to be manna, except on the sixth day. On the sixth day, you collect double amount that you need to eat and to feed your family because there's not going to be any manna out on the seventh day. The reason you collect double on the sixth day, God said, is because you're not supposed to work on the seventh day. I would remind you, this is the legislation for the old covenant at Mount Sinai. That is not our mountain. That is not our covenant. That is not our law because it's not reiterated in the New Testament. Now, as I mentioned before, they broke the covenant. They broke the commands. But what it does, again, I mentioned said earlier, that these Ten Commandments reveal the heart, the nature, the character of God. So I said a couple weeks ago when we considered it then, God desires and he's in fact built within us this need for Sabbath rest. We need recovery days. We need rest from our work. Now the Sabbath law is mentioned in the New Testament. It's just simply not reasserted in the New Testament. It's described in the New Testament, but it's not given as a law for us to follow. In fact, when it is mentioned in the New Testament, this law is mentioned as a foreshadowing, a picture of what Christ accomplishes. What was the purpose of the Sabbath law? One word, rest. What does Jesus provide for us? Rest. The Sabbath law, the seventh day law, was a picture, a foreshadowing of resting in Christ. I'll show you just one example of how this is true. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Paul writing to New Testament Christians says this, therefore let no one pass judgment. Important words. You don't let anybody judge you. On what? Questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. What's Paul saying? If you eat bacon don't let somebody judge you. You're breaking the old law. Don't let them do it. If you don't observe the Jewish holidays, Paul says, don't let anybody judge you about not observing the Jewish holidays. If somebody says, you're not keeping the Sabbath, he says, don't let anybody judge you about not keeping the Sabbath. Why? He continues. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. What is a shadow? A shadow is a one-dimensional, monochromatic image of the real thing. Maybe you've seen on the ground a shadow of yourself or a shadow of a building. It is a one-dimensional, monochromatic image of the real deal. Everything in the Old Testament law, the feasts, the dietary laws, you got to eat this, you can't eat that, the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, Paul says those are all just one-dimensional, monochromatic pictures of the true 3D, full HD, Technicolor, Dolby surround sound, Jesus Christ. What would you rather have? The one-dimensional monochromatic shadow or the full HD Jesus? Full HD Jesus, I hope. Uh, let me illustrate it like this. Whenever I drive in my truck, I have a magnetic phone mount on my dashboard that I, that's what this little thing right there is, and I magnetize my phone right there, so it's there. Sometimes I'm driving home and my wife will FaceTime me. She'll call me. That's a video call for those of you non-iPhone users. She'll video call me, and I'll answer the call while I'm driving. I don't know if that's legal or not. Please don't record this. I'm talking to her on the video chat, right? 
And I'm driving home, we're having the conversation, blah, 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 whatever we're talking about. And uh, I may pull into the driveway, back into my parking spot, get out of the truck, grab my phone, still carrying on the conversation, right? I don't want to say, hey, stop talking. I keep talking, I go upstairs, I find where she is, and as soon as I get into her presence, do I keep talking to her through the phone? Of course not. You know why? I'm not a Nimrod, okay? I'm not. I hang the call up because the 3D full color representation of the phone is there. Not just a two inch by four inch 2D thing, it's a 3D full color. This is just, that's to an infinitely greater degree. We don't worship Jesus through the Old Testament laws. Paul says those were just a shadow, just a representation, but we have the substance who is Christ. And in fact, the purpose of the fourth commandment again, was to legislate rest. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 11? Look at this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. You want rest? For it's found not in the law, it's found in Jesus. Now, when we understand the gospel, when we understand that we can find our rest only in Jesus, when we understand that all of us have broken God's law, all of us has violated his principles. All of us have broken his commands. And we understand this has separated us from God. We come to understand that Jesus, the one and only son of God, was taking on human flesh. He was born to a virgin. He lived a life where he was commanded by the Old Testament law, under the Old Testament covenant, to obey those commands. Guess what? He obeyed them perfectly. Jesus always kept the Sabbath. He always followed the dietary laws. He always obeyed the commands. And because of his perfect obedience, he did not deserve to die. Certainly not a cruel death on a Roman cross. But he did voluntarily, willingly, bearing the sin and the shame that we deserved. Why? So you may be here today and you're weary. You may be here today and you are heavy laden. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me the one who is buried and who has been resurrected to provide life, to provide rest for your weary soul. At least the fifth and final point this morning. Number five, extended authority. Extended authority. So I mentioned earlier that I include this fifth command in the first table, love God, even though it's a command about honoring your mother and your father. Why include that in the first table and not the second table of loving people? I'll give you a few reasons why. Number one, because of the very point I have here, extended authority. The authority that parents exercise in the home is the authority of God extended into your home. Does that make sense? It is God's authority, your parents' authority. And so it makes sense if we're to honor God, we're to love God, we're to serve God, we're to worship God truly, in this first table, we would have this command of honoring your mother and your father. It's directly connected to our relationship with God. Secondly, I include it here because when we consider the last five, the last five commands are all negative prohibitions, right? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet your neighbor's stuff. They're all negative prohibitions. This fifth command is a positive affirmation. Honor your dad, and your mom. And then he gives the blessing associated with it. You'll live a long life in the land that the Lord, Yahweh, is giving you. And here's the third reason I'm including extended authority in this first table, because it's Mother's Day, and what a great verse to look at on Mother's Day, right? Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, let me speak a couple things about this as we close. Think about it. This was given... This law, 3,500 years ago, in the ancient Near East. Listen, in the ancient Near East culture, in, in all cultures, whether it was Egyptian or Hebrew or Babylonian, you name it, fathers were honored in those cultures. Mothers, not so much. Moms were not honored. Women were not honored. They were pushed down. And just to correct a little misunderstanding about the church, the church has always elevated women not push down women. The gospel truth, the truth of the Bible has always lifted women up in their status in the world, not pushed women down. From the very beginning, 
In the beginning, God created them male and female. In the image of God, he created them. Both men and women are image bearers of their creator. That's one reason why uh, we can see this here, this authority, and why we honor our, our mothers on Mother's Day. But also enshrined in this um, law to honor our parents is this word honor. Honor. I looked it up in a, in a dictionary this week. That word, the Hebrew word for honor, kavad, is used a thousand times in the Old Testament, more than a thousand times. Here's Strong's Bible Word Dictionary definition. Kavad is to be heavy, be weighty, be grievous, be hard, be rich, be honorable. That's where it's translated here. Be glorious. Now, what do we take from that? In other words, you give your parents a heavy consideration. You take their opinions and their ideals as being weighty to you. And it's not just when you're zero to 18. It's when you're 55. When you're 75, your parents are still alive. Or even if they've left you a legacy, you honor your mother and your father. You consider their opinion. You consider their values. You consider their way of life as being heavy. It's glorious. That's what he's saying here. In fact, the apostle Paul, who is by no means a legalist, He's the one that restated this law in the New Testament. Again, nine of the ten are restated. Here's where number five is restated in Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then he quotes this covenant, this commandment. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Paul reminds us, New Covenant Christians, that honoring our parents, honoring your dad, honoring your mom, comes with it a blessing from God. Is that awesome? That's another reason why I think it goes in the first five and not the last five. It carries with it this blessing from Yahweh. And you know who's the perfect example of honoring their father? Jesus, <laughs> right? Who's the perfect example of obeying the will of his father, Jesus. Here's how the Lord put it in John 6. He says, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In everything, Jesus, a 33-year-old adult male who had never sinned, the second person of the Trinity, he obeyed the will of his father. So much so that the Bible says in Philippians 2, these words, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Obedient, how? To the point of death, even death on the cross. Christ was obedient to the Father, obedient even to the point of death. Why? So that he might bring us to God. So that he might bring us to God. For all who trust in Christ in his sacrificial death that we may have eternal life. And it is in that new covenant of life that Christ lays out in his apostolic witness that we have recorded for us here in the gospels and in the epistles and in the book of Revelation that, again, salvation is not the reward of obeying God's commands. Salvation by grace through faith in Jesus is the reason we obey his commands. It's the motivation that compels us to follow Christ. And associated with it are these covenant blessings from Yahweh himself. And that leads to my last thought. Submitting to the principles of God's commands brings a promise of God's blessing. 